Good evening and welcome. I'm Gary Hildebrand, Professor of Practice in Landscape Architecture here at GSD, and I'm very honored to greet you this evening on behalf of the Dean, who's here tonight, and on, the, on behalf of uh, Inaki Abalos, who's the Chair of the Department of Architecture here, to introduce tonight's speaker, Annabelle Seldorf. I was delighted when Mosin and Inaki asked me to give this introduction because I've known Annabelle for a really long time. And our collaborations have really brought immense satisfaction to me and to members of my firm. We are big fans of Seldorf Architects. I want to welcome Lisa Green also, who is one of the partners of Seldorf Architects and who's here tonight. Annabelle Seldorf was raised in Cologne, received her Bachelor of Architecture degree from Pratt Institute and a Master of Architecture degree from Syracuse University in Florence. She founded Seldorf Architects in 1988. The firm has completed many prestigious projects, including the Neue Gallery in New York, which is probably the project that um, brought really great fame to a very young firm at that time. The Sterling and Francine Clark Art Institute, uh, which uh, I've had the pleasure of working on with Annabelle and her team. Uh, the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World at NYU in New York, over near the Metropolitan, and the John Hay Library at Brown University. You'll see some about these projects this evening. And, of course, very well known, um, many galleries, many arts projects for David Zwerner, for Hauser and Wirth, Barbara Gladstone, Gladstone Gallery, among others. Earlier this year, the firm received the commission for a major expansion of the Museum of Contemporary Art in San Diego. So this march of the arts goes on. The firm also owns a, produ a product line known as Vika, which was founded by Annabelle's grandmother, which is just an astonishing and beautiful thing, um, thereby extending their practice into the making of beautiful objects and furnishings. Annabelle Seldorf designs with a strong and quiet voice. Her work spans many categories, all with serious purpose and the kind of refinement that we all hope for in our work. Big focus on the arts and cultural institutions, as I've said, perhaps more uniquely than any practice today. And among some very compelling urban projects, a remarkable one that we look forward to hearing about tonight, maybe the best known recycling center this side of the East River in New York. This exquisite juxtaposition of a recycling center and perhaps we could say the recycling of old buildings and the making of new things evidences a rigorously attuned sense of the role of art in contemporary life and a timely focus on the civics and the mechanics of reuse, reduce, and recycle. I think all of this work offers us something quite optimistic and vital for our world. Those who write about the work of Seldorf Architects speak passionately about restraint, about understatedness, order and clarity, precision, discipline, quiet, and a deep and profound respect for the detailed realities and expressive possibilities of program. Every time, in every project, we're talking about revered objects of culture and ways of assimilating and positioning their reception, setting them up for a refined experience that's culturally significant and often deeply moving. When we look at this work, whether it's a historic place reinvented or something newly created, I think we see the rigor of considering things, deciding things, very decisive. Each thing has found its place, and there's a prevailing order. Contrary to what some might think about restraint as a mode of operating in design in our time, in their work, order and restraint are not the opposite of joy, nor of innovation nor of invention. Order and restraint produce these qualities, these things, and they generate experience. Thinking about this brought to mind for me a quote from Mies van der Rohe, 
who is frequently and I think perhaps correctly cited as a recognizable influence in Annabelle's work. The quote appears in one of those beautiful essays on Mies by our dear departed friend Detlef Mertens. It's about the great humanistic potential of order in our lives. Quoting Mies, Mies says, organization is the determination of function. Order, however, imparts meaning. If we would give to each thing what intrinsically belongs to it, then all things would easily fall into their proper place, and only there they could really be what they are. And there they would fully realize themselves. I think it's a beautiful personification. That's what an English major would say. If we do these things, I think Mises is saying, quote, the chaos in which we live would give way to order, and the world would again become meaningful and beautiful. And that's the world I want to live in. Let me come back for a moment to the voice. There's an architectural voice, as I've noted, which is, finds great force. It's a quiet architectural voice, as some have said, but ironically, it finds great force in focused restraint and quietude. Also with Annabelle, there's a remarkable human voice, which has a particular kind of timbre that makes you want to listen. The persuasive voice in the work gains strength through its restraint and compels you to look more closely. The arresting oral voice brings you to a plane of conversation that justly complements and fortifies the search for clarity and the pursuit of the timeless. Earlier this year, the American Academy of Arts and Letters awarded Annabelle their Award in Architecture, citing the strong personal direction in her work. In the citation, Todd Williams said this, the work of Annabelle Seldorf is like a diamond. It ranges from the exquisite to the industrial, always honed by the precision of her gaze. Those are nice words. Her restrained, understated elegance, intelligence, and ethical core has made her a unique figure among architects and an inspiration to us all. I think everyone loves to see and to hear and to experience this finely tuned voice. Please join me in a warm welcome for Annabelle. put my glasses on. I can't see anything anyway. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, first of all, thank you so very much for having me and thank you for coming in such great numbers. I'm humbled and uh, nervous. I'll get over my nervousness and then I'll start boring you, so not to worry. Um, Gary, thank you so much for these incredibly nice things you said. Um, I don't think I can be quite as articulate, but I will shepherd you through um, a selection of projects that we brought along, and hopefully some things uh, will arise to, to think about and talk about. I would like to quote Mies van der Rohe any day, all day long, um, and I wish I could remember every smart thing he ever said. I don't. Uh, but he did come from the same region where I grew up, and forever I've sort of felt a kinship with Mies van der Rohe simply because I think he had a super dry sense of humor, and that is always present in the work. And nobody ever talks about that. Nobody ever talks about the pleasure of the humor in it all. Um, but it is what keeps me going and um, what I think brings people together in a very unique way. And the sort of, it's not humor in terms of funny, it's humor in terms of maybe embracing, maybe being more generous, more understanding, um, and more human. And so, anyway. Uh, I better get started, otherwise we'll never stop. So anyway, I, I, I thought to start with a, with a f 
funny saying by, by Emerson, which has always meant to me something. Things we do ourselves, we understand. And that's how I came to architecture. My father was an architect and um, I thought that was the worst profession ever because it didn't make any money and it took a lot of time. Um, but then I didn't know what else to do. And I've heard other people talk about how they came to architecture and they talk about how they always wanted to be an architect. Not me. But today, 30 years later, there is absolutely nothing I would rather do than keep thinking about why is architecture really at the center of the arts. I think it's the mother of all arts. And, um, and in the many years that I've been practicing, I have done many, many, many different kinds of jobs. So here's a small selection, and I'll start with the artist's cabin in Nova Scotia, which is one of my very favorite projects simply because it is so elemental and it's so, there were so many constraints to doing this project. It's um, for two artists. Um, the project is located in Nova Scotia and <clears throat> it's located on a peninsula that is very hard to get to um, nine months out of the year and there was absolutely no contractor available who would possibly consider doing this project, um, but it was executed by a lobster fisherman. And so some of the thinking about this project actually had to do with how difficult it was to build there. Um, these two artists who are good friends of mine said, we want you to help us doing this and we really wanna go out on the very, very, furthest point of this peninsula. Um, you think peninsula accessible by land? Not so much. Um, no, you can only get there by boat. So <clears throat> this wonderful boardwalk that you see, um, I would have loved to design such a thing, but it was the lobstermen who did it because they needed a boardwalk to bring the material to the site. And, and it just illustrates the spirit in which this project was done. We started out by saying we wanted to have a platform. Uh, the platform was for the dogs. Um, they're, of course, my favorite customers. Um, but this picture not only shows you the dogs, but it also shows you um, the sort of path up the hill because it was you had to go from one piece of land, from, from the sea to one piece of land to another boat to something. So it was incredibly tedious to bring bu building materials there and uh, that is how it was done. So consequently, all sizes of materials had to be a particular kind, uh, super rough weather, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There is no electricity, there's no plumbing. Um, so these buildings are very, very elemental and they're really just everything about the plan. Um, because there's so much landscape on a place like this, and it is the most gorgeous landscape, um, what I was very interested in is finding a place that gave you a little bit of respite from the, from the views and the, and the weather. So wh as you arrive, you arrive in, can I call it a courtyard, maybe? And then, and then an assembly of these three independent cabins where bedroom is here, living room is here, this is my room by the way, and um, a little sort of makeshift bathroom. What this did is it created an urban condition in the empty landscape and, um, all right, let's go on, it's marvelous. The weather is intense, the view of the sea is fantastic and, um, in many ways, this sort of sums up how I go about it. It's an incredibly practical building. It's incredibly, or assembly of little cabins. Um, it's very plausible and it takes a great, it relates to the landscape and it relates to how, uh, how it's being used. So <coughs> um, it is now almost 10 years since these cabins were built. And every year, my friends send me new pictures of them, and they kind of remain equally as plausible. So, um, 
I always like to, to think that that's a place to come back to. And there, there is that grand sea. Um, by contrast, then, a project that Gary mentioned earlier, the Neue Galerie in New York, um, is a building by Carrere and Hastings. And um, whenever I talk about the work that we do, I'm a little bit nervous that we get pegged for being the restoration architect, um, which, of course, comes with, as a young architect in New York City, we did every little renovation you could possibly imagine, starting with a bathroom, going to a bathroom with a kitchen, going to bathroom, kitchen, and living room. This obviously was a little bit bigger than that. Um, when I first saw the building, I thought, yeah, this is, this is serious. Carrere and Hastings, everybody has associations with um, the perfect Beaux-Arts architecture that exists in New York City. Um, but when Ronald Lauder asked us to help him develop the Neue Galerie, the Museum for German and Austrian Art, um, it was not just about understanding the building and the spaces available, but it was understanding how, um, the, how, the, how the spaces can go together. In many ways, this is very much a restoration. Though, when I go through the building today, um, I have a hard time remembering exactly what we changed, what we added, and what was there to begin with. And that is really, in my mind, a very interesting um, aspect of doing that kind of work, is to understand where is the quality of the old building, and what does it communicate, and why does it matter to keep it. Um, it requires a critical eye, uh, because believe it or not, not every arch that they made, those career and Hastings guys, um, was perfect. In fact, as we took the building apart, we found any number of inconsistencies that sort of cried for resolution. And some of them we did resolve, and they look like they've always been there. I'm very proud of that. Others, on the other hand, like the vertical shaft for a brand new elevator that you could never conceal, um, had to be articulated as new elements. And so I think that when you're doing restorations, there is, there is a kind of threesomeness to it, um, which means that you cherish and help um, all that which is great and old, that you understand where new components fit into the old language, but that you're also confident enough to sort of offset new elements in such a way that they don't aggress, so to speak. So these are some images that <clears throat> indicate how beautifully vertically daylight uh, travels through this marvelous um, domed skylight, and you can see this in the section there, is that the, that the skylight only goes to the second floor, and then on top of that is another glass floor, which illuminates the building all around. It's in a way a very European building, um, but in its use, it's a very unique house museum that um, has marvelous details. And when Ronald Lauder took this building over from his friend Serge Sabarsky, and decided to turn it into a museum, um, I was a little bit of an obvious candidate to work on the project because obviously I'm German. Um, but I feel that I learned from him because he knew all about German and Austrian art. And one of the first things he said to me was how interesting all of this revolutionary art was made the same time that this building was built. And that's always meant a lot to me because I think revolutions happen in many different ways. They're not always about what you see, but they're all about what you think. And architecture, in my mind, in more than one way, is not just what you see, but it, what it does. And um, so in, in my personal history of, of working on architectural projects, this was... Um, very, very meaningful because 
I learned for the first time that you can actually make a big difference in people's lives. Um, I remember going through the building when uh, it first opened, and I overheard people discussing details of the architecture that I thought nobody would ever notice but me. But as you undoubtedly all know, that's why we're doing this. And, and so in a very subtle, very um, elemental way, I think we make a difference by paying attention and paying attention to everything all the time. <coughs> the top floor of this, of the museum, or the, I should say the third floor, the last floor of exhibitions, was the one floor that had absolutely no detail left. So as you go through the building, you get to the third floor, and there's a lot more freedom um, of expression because because we were able to reorganize the spaces in a very different way. And, um, and this was the first exhibition uh, showing Bauhaus. Since we're on art projects, I wanted to um, show a project that is very dear to me, a project uh, for David Swerner. And his, somebody pointed out to me that I've done 19 projects for this client. Um, and we're not married, we're not lovers. Uh, we're still friends, though. Uh, David and I, in a way, grew up together. Both of us grew up in Cologne, uh, but we didn't know each other then. But we've now known each other for a very long time, and when he started his gallery, he came to me, and I just started my office, and he said, would you have time to help me? It's like, obviously I did. Uh, so we've done every, every gallery ever since, and uh, every house that he has, and um, we're so far along in our routine that occasionally I have to call him and say, can you come take a look at this, because I'm not sure that I'm doing the right thing here. But um, David, in, uh, in the thick of the recession in 2008, bought a property and said, you know what, we're going to build the best gallery building in town and we're going to really do something exceptional. And so, like with every project, we battled about what would we do, what it would it look like, and, and we had some of the same opinions and some different opinions. But very quickly, what emerged is the idea that we wanted to explore doing a building in um, cast-in-place concrete. And Little did I know that that was really super complicated. Doing cast-in-place concrete in New York City and five stories tall, no less, um, is a bit of a tour de force. I'm really glad that it's over. Um, but it was a fantastic learning experience. Among other, because the idea was that despite the fact that it's a concrete building, um, it was meant to be a gold lead building, and it is. And thinking about it today, I, I, I really think we have to find better ways uh, than to use so much concrete. Uh, having said that though, boy was it a pleasure uh, to do what all architects want to do, uh, is play around with the malleability of, of concrete. So. In this case, we worked very, very closely with the client. Again, it, some of it has to do with the history that we have together, but also um, the client was a very driven person who really wanted to talk about, this is how I want to show art, and this is how we want to see uh, daylight. And maybe today this building is what represents most closely to the things that are important to me. Namely, that they're incredibly well-proportioned spaces that um, deal with daylight, where you can look at art that present a kind of calm and quiet uh, that induces the desire to spend time in a space. But at, at the same time, it also has a sort of tectonic um, power, I guess, and so 
there is a presence of architecture uh, that never interferes with the viewing of art, but that at all times brings a kind of groundedness. When I look through the building today, what I think about is that we did not one thing more than we had to do, but nothing too little. And that's in a way sums up what I'm really interested in, is like when you do too much, that's relatively easy. It's a little bit like eating cake. And <laughs> but not doing too much, being absolutely certain that you didn't do too little um, is really what it's all about. Because if you do too little, then nothing happens. Um, and it's a vacuum. And it means that nobody got excited about anything. So I go around this building and I'm still very excited about this five-story concrete stair that has this very, very thin um, structure, uh, very thin, thin stringer. And of course that was inspired by Corbusier's stair in La Tourette. Um, I can't tell you how many times we looked at that picture and showed it to the structural engineer and said, you can get there. Um, we fought the battles that occurred after um, Hurricane Sandy. Um, the building was completely submerged at a time, fortunately it was still under construction, so none of the finishes were done, but a lot of the equipment that the contractors had on site were, were um, destroyed and, and it was a really rough time. So it was all the more important for us to realize that what we were doing was in fact a very energy efficient building um, where a lot of energy is saved through daylight, through efficient, efficient equipment, um, stairs, etc., etc. So here are just some pictures of the exhibition spaces as they go through the building. Um, you will have seen in this section that it's basically an L-shaped building with five stories that are approximately 25 feet wide on the upper floors and on the only the ground floor has an 18-foot ceiling with these very large skylights that can be divided in any number of different ways. This is an, uh, an image of the Ad Reinhardt show, a phenomenal show um, that was on last year. And in every, in every different uh, version, I sort of get very excited that it is possible to, to have these totally daylit spaces. Uh, the upstairs floors are uh, have wood floors. Some of them have uh, are facing the street and, strictly speaking, have a southern orientation. Uh, some of them have a northern orientation. Some of them are more square. Some of them are these sort of very simple rectangular spaces. And that's something I enjoy a great deal: is to sort of evaluate what makes what makes a good space. Is it? It's the relationship of height to width to space, but it's also about how you enter a space, um, what it is that you do, how daylight comes in, and the more you think about it, the more complex it gets, and the less you do, the more interesting it gets. Um, a pro another project that Gary has talked about, and it is where we met, uh, is the Clark Institute, the museum building in Williamstown, Massachusetts. So very quickly, the biggest voice on the block was Tadao Ando, who did not one but two buildings uh, for the Clark. Um, you've probably seen in the exhibition outside uh, the wonderful um, Stonehill Restoration Center. Is it called a restoration center? Conservation Center. Uh, and here is the new visitor center. Uh, our task was to renovate the so-called 1955 building and the Manton Research Center, uh, which are two very disparate buildings. One was built in 1955 in the shape of a temple to um, exhibit the art of uh, Sterling and Francine Clark. 
uh, they placed the museum just outside of uh, if an atom bomb hit New York City, it wouldn't have gotten all the way to Williamstown. I read that the other day. I thought that was interesting. But anyway, so there they built a temple for themselves and the, their really magnificent collection. And a short time later, um, the 1973 uh, Pietro Belusky building um, was added to the mix. And so there were these two disparate buildings with parking lots in front of them. And yes, they had wonderful art there, and people were very attached to the way in which they got to look at the art. Um, but in the end, none of it hanged together all that well. In comes Tadao Ando, who was asked to design the visitor center, and he very swiftly uh, asked Reed Hildebrandt, Gary in particular, uh, to help him figure out how to do the uh, water feature, and really to take care of the entire campus of, of the Clark. Um, Ando and Reed Hildebrandt started this work some 13 years ago, and I very naively came in seven years later, um, and we were commissioned to, to renovate and restore the, the 1955 building, which has very complicated proportions and a really strange circulation. But in this new setup, um, it was all going to be different. And indeed it was. Um, again, I might get lost in telling you too much about it. Uh, it's, it's worth going to it because all aspects of it, the total of the project that uh, the three of us did, really the four of us, uh, I have to include Gensler architects who were the formidable uh, executive architect. But what we all brought together to this thing completely transformed uh, an art institute into something that I think includes life in a way in which museums rarely do because it includes the landscape. Um, it provides a kind of meditative quality to, to a landscape that in and by itself is absolutely gorgeous. However, back to our task, um, what you can see here is that the, the old building was entered sideways by the time that we got to it through the Belusky building and then had this kind of race course uh, of spaces around. So what we were able to do is, together with the director and the curators, um, we reset spaces, a little bit like a chiropractor. Um, our task was to not change things dramatically so that they were not recognizable anymore, but uh, change them enough so that they were rejuvenated and positive. And that sounds like a cop-out. Um, but it isn't. It was a very difficult task to reproportion spaces, to think about the art that was going to be shown there, to understand how decorative elements were part and parcel of the substance, um, to love the art and love the space, even though the space was not at all lovable. And bring it together in such a way that it started to make sense. Again, in my mind, what I'm very proud of in this building is that there really isn't too much that we did. There's not too much to look at in the architecture, but plenty, enough. Um, so now you can appreciate the vistas that go through the building into the landscape, um, you can you feel sort of at liberty to uh, circulate in a very generous way to sort of understand the spirit in which Francine and Sterling Clark put together their collection and um, to understand the setting in which this is all meant to have been. There is one of the lovely dancers by Degas. Um, there's a phenomenal porcelain and silver collection. And for us, it was a great pleasure because 
there are the there is the sort of bigger picture architecture that had to do with reproportioning spaces and resetting the lighting and figuring out the circulation. But fortunately, all the way to the end, we were part and parcel of designing um, the vitrines, the, the uh, colors. Um, not everybody likes all of the colors we did, but I do. And um, yeah, so there it is. In the end, we were also asked to design um, an exhibition in the Ando space. And I must say that gave me a great deal of pleasure because it's sort of where the different worlds came together and it's sort of the way forward uh, for the Clark because now with this really marvelous, much taller ceilinged uh, space that has this view, as you can see through the screen, all the way out to the, to the water feature. Um, the Clark can explore different venues. They can have exhibitions, traveling exhibitions from places that they were never able to obtain before. And yeah, for me it was very meaningful because I thought that's where we all kind of came together. Um, I get to go to France a fair amount and I'm very happy because the south of France is a really nice place. Um, in particular, now uh, we get to go to Arles, where the Luma Foundation, a, fun, a contemporary art foundation, has acquired um, old railroad headquarters. This is where in the 20s, all the way until the 40s, um, railroad cars were built. And some 10 years ago, um, Maya Hoffman, who is the patron of the Luma Foundation in Arles, uh, hired Frank Gehry to design a sort of significant building. A significant building with the purpose of communicating about art. It wasn't first and foremost about showing art, but it was meant to be a place that brings people together, that sets a new sign in Arles. And where seminars can be held, where lectures can be given, where performances could be had. Um, and it was always the intention to use the old shed roof buildings and refurbish them uh, to create a different kind of exhibition space. And um, luckily, I am in charge of of working on these buildings. And um, we have a, a little French team in the office. <laughs> when I say a French team, it actually just means that we enjoy going to France together. Um, <laughs> and we're, we're working on an exhibition space in what's called the Mécanique, another one that's called Les Forges, and eventually other buildings on the site that are not color indicated right here, um, will follow suit. And you can see how awkward uh, the plan looks at first glance, but it's very, very interesting because it actually, this project in a small way, um, reflects the landscape of southern France with the sort of Alpille on one hand, the Provence on the other hand. Um, it's, it's quite marvelous how, how the landscape plays into, into the nature of this building. The landscape architect is a young Belgian um, landscape architect whose name is Bas Smeets. And um, he's working hand in hand with us on trying to understand what is the best course of action for, for these different spaces. Um, when I say that we're restoring these buildings, then I think that's actually wildly exaggerated because there is practically nothing left except for the outer shell which on, in a funny way is the constraint that I'm a little bit interested in on some level. Um, there is no building there, there's just an outer wall. And so we're recreating um, uh, spaces that fulfill a completely different purpose. They're all about flexibility, they're all about exhibition, and, um, and all about people 
coming together. And that's maybe what is the most interesting thing about this, is that, yes, it investigates different uh, kinds of art exhibition and different ways of exploring where contemporary art is going. Um, but at the same time, it also is a very important place for for Al that for a very long time had relayed, relied on the on the jobs that the railroad had offered. And so now those days are gone. Arl has become a place of tourism. There's a lot of um, many Roman ruins in, in this town. And establishing this art center that has different tentacles um, is, is really an interesting thing. And for us in particular, it's interesting to work with the different curators who all come from all over the world um, to establish different kind of spaces. <coughs> this is an image of the uh, renovated and expanded um, building that's called the Mechanique. And we're using elements that are very present in the, in the hot climate of the south of France, uh, re reusing uh, the existing shapes to create one big column free space. I think the next image will show what that looks like. Now this is the facade from the main piazza and there is a, is it 60, 75, um, col 75 foot column free space. Um, and that's obviously something where a lot of different things, a lot of different kinds of installations can happen. Um, again, the interaction of art and architecture is always a very sort of interesting thing for us in our work. Um, a project that we've completed very recently that's just opened with the beginning of the school year um, is another uh, sort of restoration, refurbishment, repurposing uh, of the John Hay Library in Providence, Rhode Island. And um, we were very pleased to, to be asked to refurbish pretty much the entire building and bring certain services to it that uh, don't exist right now. But the main story really is the main reading room, uh, which is a when you see it in a photograph, a sort of rather large and impressive space. Um, this is, of course, a picture from, I think, the late 30s. Um, and uh, bringing this space to life and thinking about what do libraries do today? How do we use them? How is learning affected uh, by the space? And what does it mean to spend concentrated and focused time in a grand room like this uh, were only just some of the subjects that um, we discussed with the librarian and the people from Brown. So many things have changed in very subtle ways in what we did in the building. We sort of created this uh, slightly more generous entrance hall that has just a single um, entrance into this reception area and then focused a lot of attention on trying to bring a special atmosphere to this room. And I don't want to spend too much time on this because as in many of the projects, uh, what we do is we start out by saying, well, how, what's the, where's it at? Where did it start out? What is, what's the value of the architecture? And if we can reveal that uh, in the most pure and most uh, genuine way, then, then a lot is said already. When you say things like that, it means that you have to think about absolutely every surface, every finish, every proportion, how it goes together, and it's wildly tedious. Um, what I am very proud of, though, is that we sort of recreated the lamps that had been there at one time, and very quickly when they when they installed these lamps, it was like an Oscar Schlemmer ballet because all of a sudden your eyes went up and there was this great pleasure in, in having this kind of whimsical element in the, in the room that may have been there at one time but that disappeared completely. And 
um, that sort of bringing that back is something that I was quite proud of. And um, <clears throat> of course, it in, in if it included every aspect of it, it's like how how do the students use the space? Um, what are the finishes? What are the what's the carpet? How does the vitrine to the other space go? And so on and so forth. Um, we thought it might be worth showing you just very quickly a couple of the um, projects that we've worked on over the last couple of years where that are temporary and that involve exhibiting things. Um, what was really a lot of fun was working uh, with Massimiliano Gioni, the director of the previous Art Biennale, um, on setting the stage for for the artworks in the Arsenale. In many ways, a tall order. The Arsenale is, I think, <coughs> a half a kilometer, if not longer. Um, this incredibly powerful space. I don't know if you've been there before, but I've gone to the Arsenale for many, many years to the Architecture Biennale, to the Art Biennale. And every time you go through it, you think the architecture is more interesting than anything that you could see there. So when Massimiliano asked me to help him with this exhibition, I thought, what we have to do is actually put everything in balance. There has to be a way that you can at once enjoy the architecture and let the power of this marvelous building, which was at one time a, what do you call that, um, where they make um, the corderie, is the... Um, uh, ropes, the, the, the rope making, this rope factory. Um, hence the length of the building, because that's where the ropes were laid out along the entire length. And um, you can see the, the tallness of the space, the power of the, of the columns, and interrupted by the sort of occasional walls. So, to me, the most interesting thing about it was to find some sort of um, rhythm to understand where you would stop, where you would continue, and literally find that balance. And every time I try to explain it, I realize that I can't really quite do justice to it um, because I think it all has to do was accepting the strength of the original architecture, but sort of not being dwarfed by it um, with the exhibition space. Um, we've also been the <laughs> architects, if you can call it that, of a tent. Um, it's, a, it's a fair tent in, uh, that gets built every year in London that's called Freeze Masters. Um, we were asked there to help organize the architecture, the structure, the circulation, and the kind of spirit um, that this temporary art fair <coughs> sets up in Regency Park in London. It's now in its third year, and it's kind of revolutionized, if I say so myself, how people look at temporary art setups. Um, so. Basically, what we did is we sort of designed a very rigorous pattern, no, not pattern, but um, system um, f to laying out different sized booths. And the people who rent these booths uh, had only three colors available. Um, oftentimes, people refer to 50 shades of gray after we did this. Um, I didn't know what that meant. Um, but I was really very, very pleased with myself here, uh, simply because it was such an elegant way of looking at art. And you were at once able to look at antiquities as you were encountering, I don't know, paintings by Andy Warhol. And, and you weren't getting tired by all the different accoutrements that you usually find. I enjoy doing these exhibition um, designs. 
for two reasons. One is that everything in architecture takes so damn long. So when you're designing an exhibition, that's usually, there's a limited period of time. There's only that much time to design it, and then it goes away. Um, but we've done a number of, of Picasso exhibitions with the Gagosian Gallery, and this one in particular that was in London uh, was a great pleasure. It was getting to know the art, um, understanding the motivation of behind uh, the paintings, understanding that all that Picasso ever did was paint sculpture or make sculpture, and understand how it all goes together. And um, so spending time on that, I thought, was very, very inspiring. And yeah, there it is. Um, just a few pictures of a private building that we designed in um, Long Island. This is a private house, another house for an art dealer. <laughs> so looking at art was definitely part of the program. Um, but more than anything, to me, it was important that it was a house that responded to the landscape, that used materials, uh, that belong there. Um, it's a wood house. Again, it's about proportion. Again, it's about uh, daylight. Again, it's about how people live in it. It has all has to do with where does the family come together? What does it mean to build a house in the summer? I mean, a summer house for somebody so that the in inside outside relationships are very important. Understand how the seasons uh, give a different reading to the quality of the house, and how does it respond to the ocean, to the sky, um, and how, yeah, I guess, how does the inside-outside work? Um, in this particular case, everything was predicated on having natural materials, and there's a kind of rational system uh, that, that provides a kind of modular uh, upon which the house is laid out. And that is extended all the way out to the terrace so that <coughs> on the outside there is this sort of pergola that creates an outdoor room that it gets as used almost as much during the summer months as the inside gets used in the winter months. And um, by contrast then, <laughs> uh, this is a building that has received a fair amount of attention. Um, it's, a, it's a condominium building on 24th Street and 11th Avenue in New York. And it's the first sort of tall building that we built. Uh, this was the first, no, it wasn't the first. It was the second or third project that we did for a developer. And what was interesting about it was that it's a relatively small site with a spectacular view um, of the Hudson River and the, and the landscape beyond. And um, there are any number of constraints to a site like this, uh, namely that you have to abide by street wall rules. In other words, you have to build in the street wall up to 80 feet tall, um, et cetera, et cetera. It, at the same time, it was also an extraordinarily tall building. We were allowed with a restricted FAR, a floor area ratio, which decides how much, how many square feet you can build, um, we were allowed a very tall building. So each apartment is very tall, and as a result, you have this sort of attenuated proportion over a very small footprint. There also was an idea that floated around that we made work where um, eventually you were able to drive your building into the car to a special elevator that would bring your car all the way up to your floor. <coughs> it's slightly preposterous, I agree. Um, but not altogether preposterous because it was only very few parking spaces and it was really only um, if that is what you wanted to do with the space. You could also use it for, I don't know, your studio or your wine cellar or something like that. Um, but it was sort of a special accommodation uh, to 
a neighborhood where parking is, is basically doesn't exist. To me, however, what is the most interesting thing is how it relates to its urban context. And that is, to this day, what I'm most proud of. Uh, this is a picture of the terracotta base that we used. We sort of rediscovered in a number of projects um, a way of using this age-old material, terracotta, which interests me because uh, it gets made as a block. It is applied either as a rain screen or as a masonry unit. And in other words, it sort of really has to do with how you build a building, what the physical reality is of putting details together. Um, and out of the terracotta shaft draws, grows a stainless steel um, facade that becomes the um, enclosure for, for the taller floor plates. They're almost all duplex apartments with these very, with these double high spaces in the living spaces. Um, they're very generous, but very tightly designed at the same time. Um, I have marvelous views. And, and they're a little bit unusual because they're at once industrial, but they're also, um, I don't know, they're special, I think. So um, here is that recycling facility that uh, Gary mentioned earlier. And in some ways, that uh, is perhaps my most favorite project. Have I said that a few times a bit earlier? Um, but this municipal recycling project came to us as a, uh, in, in a small competition. Um, I knew very little about recycling. I knew to separate paper from glass, um, and now learned that that's actually not that important. But, but Sims, which is a uh, private company, went into partnership with New York City, and they acquired a uh, pier on, in Brooklyn Sunset Park, which is the sort of remainder of the working waterfront. This pier at one time, uh, was used by the police for, for discarded cars. Uh, there's a prison at the other end of it. And in many ways, it wasn't a particularly desirable neighborhood. But it has completely changed everything. And when uh, Sims hired us to do this project, they already knew that this was going to be a very important, very revolutionary and groundbreaking project. And the mayor, uh, Bloomberg at the time, was incredibly interested in making these kinds of changes. Why is it important? Because uh, municipal recycling at this scale doesn't, hasn't existed until now and it affords the city a much, much more efficient way uh, to bring material to the recycling facility. And so our first task was actually to sort out the, um, the different components that go into a recycling facility, a tipping building, a processing building, and a bale building. What do they do? Trucks come in in a segregated path. They get weighed. They drive into what we conceived as a sort of courtyard. They come under a bridge, drive in here, and unload um, their material. And then they drive away again. Uh, in reverse order, trucks come here and pick up baled material which has been processed in here. This looks all perfectly logical and reasonably easy. There are barges along here that both pick up and drop off material. Um, we made a kind of logical green space here. A visitor center uh, administration building was introduced as an additional component, which in and by itself is very, very unusual because usually recycling or uh, garbage related material <coughs> buildings, I meant, facilities are exclude the idea of education or the public entering. So now as a, as a private person, you come around here, you enter this 
a little administration building where you can visit an exhibition on the second floor, and this is in particular for school children, and then go up a stair and go across this exciting bridge here, look into the tipping building, and see it all happen. Um, <clears throat> the, the logic of it uh, wasn't at all present. It was really trying to understand what do people do first and how do we separate and keep people safe? And how does the, how is there a kind of process and elegance um, to, to, the, to the use of the building? Um, it was also evident that there was no money available to build a building of this kind. I think this is 120,000 square feet altogether. Um, and it's a pre-engineered building, which would typically be just one of those regular box-type buildings. Instead, we got together with the engineers. We turned the structure outside, outside and created this sort of maybe Prouvé-inspired, uh, um, much more expressive building. And this is what it looks like on the inside. Uh, to me, what's most important, however, is that the that the master plan led to a very precise series of spaces, the interior spaces and the exterior spaces. This is actually um, the machinery that processes all of this material. There's many optical sorters. There's different stro uh, streams of... of um, recyclable materials that can be processed all at the same time is highly complicated. Fortunately, I didn't have to figure out that part. Um, but, but of course, it was part and parcel of how can, how can all of this material can arrive there. Here you see uh, sort of a picture of that looks into the bridge, but also an assembly of the materials that we used. Everything is very, very simple. And again, we relied on the idea that if we could get away with doing using fewer materials and fewer, um, fewer details, we could ultimately produce better quality and a better experience for those using the space, but also for those looking at the space. And so after a number of years of planning, um, we not only happily received an award by the mayor and the, the PDC, the Public Design Commission, um, but now it's there. It functions and it really operates incredibly well for the city. And all of the green space around it grows in and it looks like it belongs there and um, is very worthwhile. Fantastically located. There's, where is it? Somewhere out here is the Statue of Liberty. Oh, I guess our building is so big you can't see it. <laughs> and there it is. Thank you very much. If anybody has any questions, go on ahead. Okay. And Mies talks a lot about detailing in his in his buildings. Um, can you talk to us about how you detail your buildings and how that? Um, translates into um, what you said where um, you do enough, but you, you don't do uh, too little? Um, yeah, I think uh, we keep it with Mies. I'm sure that you've seen and read and heard that he made uh, his students and the people in his office draw every brick. Um, and that seems a little bit absurd. But paying attention to everything all the time is really 
um, I think where a lot of quality comes from. It's not about inventing details, it's not about custom making things, but it's understanding how things go together and what not to do. Um, I heard Richard Serra talk about his work, and he talked for a long time about all of the things he decided one could not do. A sculpture could not be on a pedestal, it could not hang from the ceiling, it could not do this, that, and the other thing. And I was deeply impressed by that, because I think in, in a funny way, that's a, that's a good way to sort of figure out what you can do, because very little is left by the time that you've eliminated all those things that you can't do. Um, but that sort of directs a path. And um, the detailing part, in some ways, I, I really think it's very strictly hierarchical. You first have to have an idea about what you're going to do on a site and why that matters and how it means something to, to people and to function. And we always say that function sort of dictates everything. But that's of course only half true because there's any number of ways in which function can be interpreted and it's not just for those people using the space but it's also for those people living in the environment of the space. So when we design apartment buildings, the detailing that goes into these apartment buildings is very important, not just for the people living there, but for everybody who walks by on the street every day and for the urban context that you, for a very long time, create there. Um, anyway, I think I sort of slightly overshot <laughs> my answer here. That's um, fine. <laughs> but Thank you. Sure. Annabella, you speak about uh, paying attention to the details, and paying attention to the details in an academic setting is different from paying attention to details in an office setting. How do you keep um, staff and clients, and maybe government clients or clients that uh, are private clients, or in the case of New York, a client that's a developer, engaged with those details? Um, how could they not be interested? Well, as a developer, you spoke about okay. FAR and... Uh, no, I think that's it's a task. I think that you have to sort of make sure that you, that you speak in ways that people understand, that you understand them, that you listen, um, and that what you hear is part and parcel of what you produce. It's reciprocal, it's iterative, it's a dialogue. You never do anything alone. And when I talked about the work that we do today, you think... Um, it's just me. No, it's not just me. Uh, it's my partner, Lisa Green, who is here tonight, my partner, Sarah Lopergolo, and um, a few other partners, Julie, Bill, um, and some 60 other people. And everybody has to engage with everybody, and everybody has to pay attention, and we have to listen to those people um, who hire us and who are willing to have that conversation. It's intense, it's just, you can't stop, and you have to sort of make sure that um, that you maintain that attention. No slacking off. Thank you. Hi, um, yeah, I was, curious to know a little bit more about the Clark project, which uh, like you mentioned that there was the, the 1955 building, which is the classical temple, and then the brutalist Manton Research Center next door. Mm -hmm. um, but you didn't, you didn't really elaborate on what was happening with the Manton Center. Which, and I was sort of curious to know um, not only what's happening there, but how do you mediate between two such drastically different buildings? It's a good question. And <clears throat> and actually, talking about the Clark sort of could be a whole uh, thing unto itself, and I know that Gary would contribute a great deal. But what's interesting is that those two buildings have nothing to say to one another, absolutely nothing. Um, they are uh, connected by a bridge, and for 
all those years since 1973, they have coexisted in relative disharmony. And it wasn't until the really very gifted design by Tadao Ando, the third thing came in that really represents a sort of sea change because all of a sudden it's away from those two buildings that are sort of, uh, people say, like a dysfunctional family. Somebody referred to them as the mad couple or the feuding siblings or um, anyone, any number of, of analogies have been drawn. Um, but what Ando's building, and really more than the building, the landscape um, that he developed with Gary did, does, is a sort of third element, allows each of the buildings to sort of stand on their own and have a kind of dignity that they perhaps didn't have before, uh, because they're both buildings of great quality. The brutalist Beluski building is interesting because it is such, um, it's a research center, and so there's a library component part of it, there's a big atrium uh, that we are still working on, which will open in the beginning of next year, um, and there is a print study center, so there's some exhibition in there, and there's a large auditorium in there, so there's plenty of things that bring the community together that are of great use um, for the students in Williamstown, um, and that are of great quality, I would say, but that have been sort of underutilized and neglected and not really paid attention to. And I think um, it's, the, it's the visitor center that has kind of refocused how the buildings sit to one another and how they respond to the, how they turn to the really incredible Berkshire landscape. Thank you. Hi, um, you were talking about what makes a good space. Uh, what you define it, um, the detail, the usage, the proportions of it. If you, um, the combination, what would you define as the perfect or the best space for a building? The really great thing, there isn't a best. Um, I marvel at all of the spaces that people do um, that are so different from anything that I could think of. Um, but for myself, it's a kind of wayfinding. It all depends on the circumstances, like what's the building for, where is it located, what's the climate, um, what is it function, what does it do overall. And in some ways, it, it's all about the balance. It's all about the sort of the proportion. And when I say the proportion, I don't just mean the physical proportion, but it's how one thing sits relative to another. And the longer I do this, the more satisfying I find that there isn't just a single answer, but that there is always some ambivalence, and that ambivalence brings tension, and that tension in turn needs to be pushed in order to, to kind of provide um, a gravitas of, uh, of a certain kind. And so my answer would be that if I could answer it, um, it would become formulaic right away. And I think that's what we want to avoid at all cost. Thank you. Uh, How and why did your involvement in the recycling project come about? Um, a precise question can be answered in a precise manner. We were one of four people who were considered by a rookie client um, to build this recycling center. They knew that they had a very important project on their hands, but they had very little experience in architecture, and so among other, they had hired uh, a sort of engineering firm that does industrial engineering and as a matter of course, do the architecture as well. But somehow or other it became clear to them that they had to maybe do more than that and they were blessed with a um, very inspired CEO who was a little bit of an architecture fan. And so they set out to 
hire a person to propose different architects. And we were one of those firms, in many ways probably the most unlikely candidate. And that is how. Why? Is I think it was truly our um, unadulterate enthusiasm. We built models, we sort of had all sorts of ideas and they simply couldn't resist us. Another question about the uh, recycling center. I remember after the Hurricane Sandy, K Michael Kimmelman wrote an article praising not only the elegance of the design and the generosity of the public program, but there was a decision made somewhere in the process to elevate the entire site above, considerably above what would have been required under building code, That's correct. which must have incurred considerable expense and some, some complications for the design. So uh, I'm wondering if that was your decision and how that decision was made. Well, it's obviously a very wise decision because the plant was completely unharmed in Hurricane Sandy. Yeah, again, some of those really good decisions, one would like to think that one had a hand at those. I didn't. Um, the, it was the, the person, the general manager of, of the facility who is a very smart man and who thought about climate change for many years. Um, and said we would be absolutely foolish if we are resurfacing the entire pier and didn't take into consideration that there are rising tides. Evidence of that has been around for a long time. Um, so they did something that is a little bit interesting because they didn't just raise the site, but they used recycled glass um, as infill material or at least a good portion of it. Uh, another portion is, is the the molten rock uh, from the Seventh Avenue, from the Seventh Second Avenue. Second. I don't know where Seven comes from. Um, Second Avenue Subway. So they they did this, and effectively uh, during uh, Hurricane Sandy, nothing happened to the to the facility. Thank you so much.